Welcome everybody to our uh, third session of our third cycle of uh, international webinar on heraldry in traveling European juridical manuscript. Um, we are now at our last session of this year. Uh, the three years have been very, uh, very rich in exchange and in dialogues on uh, juridical manuscripts and on heraldry. So we are very proud. And uh, now I leave uh, the floor to Miguel Sestes, uh, that is co-organizer of this even with me. And that uh, introduce, will introduce uh, our uh, speaker of this evening. Thank you, Alessandra. So um, here we, uh, today, excuse me, we are listening to Miguel de Cruz Fernandes. He is a PhD student in the history department of the University of Chicago, specializing in medieval European intellect, intellectual, cultural, and religious history. He completed he, his master's degree in history at the Universidad Nova de Lisboa in July 2021. He was also received, he has also received a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics and computation from the University of Lisbon. So Miguel, welcome and you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will share my screen. I think, yeah, I think this is the one. Um, yes. Do you see the title? Yeah, perfect. Yes, we see everything. Great. Um, so. Amid recurrences of the deadliest pandemic ever, endemic Europe-wide warfare and intensifying climate change, the late 14th century, not the early 21st century, although we also have two popes, uh, was a critical time for political authority in Europe, where two men called themselves King of France and two others bore the title of Roman Pontiff. This was especially so for King Richard II of England, as he faced rebellions by peasants and barons alike, um, and successfully invaded Scotland and reclaimed Ireland in vain and was eventually deposed. In such an uncertain climate, how was legitimacy to be determined? When law and blood were not enough, king and contestants to kingship had to invoke sophisticated visual and performative programs of persuasion. Instead of long legal syllogisms, their repertoire of arguments included diagrams, poems, dragons, and visual puns. By the end of his turbulent reign, it became clear that Richard II was going to leave no direct successor, as his childless first wife died of plague and his second wife was six years old on their wedding day. By that time, there were two strong candidates to the English throne. John of Gaunt, here, uh, first Duke of Lancaster, and Roger Mortimer, fourth Earl of March and sixth Earl of Ulster. And although Gaunt would be the next in line according to a patrilineal model of primogeniture, he was younger than his long dead brother, Lionel of Antwerp, who was Roger's maternal grandfather. Therefore, the young Mortimer, was favored by the English ambilineal succession tradition that regarded female lines as valid means of inheritance transmission. But Roger Mortimer didn't just pretend to the English throne. As descendant of uh, King Edward III, he was also a claimant to the French throne and even had, if remotely, royal Scottish blood. 
But he had all of this England, France, Scotland in common with other contestants. What made him special as a potential king was his Welshness and Irishness. Um, he was the Earl of Marsh and Ulster. Marsh here, Ulster here. Um, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, he had been appointed by the king and pretended heir of Gwynedd. I'm not sure if you've pronounced Gwynedd like that, though, uh, in North Wales here. An inheritor of vast estates, both in Ireland and in Wales. He was not merely pursuing a kingdom, he was pursuing, one could almost say, an empire. There are two extant 14th century sources, both produced in the 1390s, sponsored by the Mortimers, that explicitly support their claim to the throne. The illuminated chronicle, History of the Foundation and Founders, produced at the Augustinian Wigmore Abbey, sponsored by the Mortimers, and the poem, in praise of Sir Roger Mortimer, authored by the bard Yolo Goch. Goch means the red, probably because he had red hair. One was written in Latin and the other in Welsh. One was made by monks and the other by a bard. One was made to be seen and the other was made to be heard. Still, although diametrically dissimilar in form and genre, both share a common political and visual program. Both approach the hot topics of the time, the succession crisis and the invasion of Ireland. And they do it by deploying a profusion of genealogical, heraldic and symbolic imagery. But oddly enough, the scholarship has most focus, mostly focused on the textual features of these documents either overlooking their outstandingly visual nature or at most deeming the visual elements as merely illustrative or embellishing. In fact, as I plan to show, visuality was at the core of the Mortimer project. In this presentation, I argue that in periods of ambiguous and unstable political authority, such as the 1390s in England, the most effective way of contesting legitimacy claims was to follow the fiction writing rule, show, don't tell. Indeed, the stripping of verbal coherence often gives way to more comprehensible, memorable, and compelling ways of legitimacy, as versatile and potent media, such as poems and diagrams, cannot always be bound by sequential and analytical modes of thinking. In the words of Ayelet Ivan Ezra, linear speech performs poorly when used to describe complex, nonlinear, and multilinear objects and structures. Thence, based on a close analysis of the Mortimer sponsored sources, I aim at exploring how sound and sight were deployed by means of prophetic verse, diagrammatic genealogy, and heraldic display to bring forth the visualization of the Mortimer identity and their political designs. I'll start with a summarized context of the Mortimer sponsored sources against the backdrop, the backdrop of the succession crisis and the Irish campaign. Then I will move to the ways in which genealogical devices were used to support the Mortimer project. Thirdly, I will briefly examine how heraldic devices were deployed to project a powerful Mortimer identity. And lastly, I will show selected visual uh, rhetorical devices deployed by these sources evaluating their meaning within the overall Mortimer project. The Mortimer Chronicle was made to be seen. Its only extant copy can be found in the middle of manuscript 224 of the special collections of the University of Chicago Library. It is structured around diagrams made of roundels linked by edges and texts filling the space enclosed by the diagram's contours. This is not a, a typical uh, format in the Middle Ages. In fact, it's omnipresent in the Middle Ages and it's used for almost everything. Uh, theology, mathematics, genealogy, etc. 
as is typical of lay sponsored monastic chronicles, this is at once a historical and a legal document. The text favorably tells the deeds of each family member, and there is an insistent emphasis on estate. But above all, it is a heavily political document that deals with the Mortimer claims in the British Isles. As for Yolo's 134 lines poems, it was made to be heard. Right on the first line, he alliterates, I hope I will pronounce this well, Sir Rossier Asur Aesur, Sir Roger of the Azure Shield, alternating sibilants and trills, and simultaneously setting from the start a resonance between Roger and his emblem. Line after line, then Yolo submits to rigid and metric rhyme rigid metric and rhyme uh, schemes, but it seems that these constraints do not constrain him at all. There's another alliteration right here, valiant hair, worthy blood. This is a nodative endorsement of a very politically desirable link. But besides ingeniously handling rhyme and alliteration, Yolo craftily employs other poetic devices that provide for an arresting, an arresting acoustic effect. For example, when he repeats four times the word great, maur, and four times the word earl, yar, yarl, this anaphora enables him to expressly call Roger with great resonance, a great earl, great earl. Yolo's poem was certainly made to be recited or sung and heard, but it might also have been made to be seen. Eulogistic poetry was typically performed in the patrons' halls, considering that in the late 14th century, the patrons' halls would be wealthily decorated with the patrons' arms. Yolo's colorful evocation of heraldry, which we will see later, is not only an exercise of imagination, but a live comment on a palpable, on palpable heraldic emblems on display. Here's a genealogical diagram to help us locate John of Gaunt, Richard II, and Roger Mortimer. John of Gaunt, because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, once requested Parliament to pass a law called, um, also known as Salic Law, forbidding women to succeed to the throne, but his request was rejected, of course. Yet he did not give up on his high ambitions for the House of Lancaster. Instead, he turned to another way of making his claim via his wife's ancestor, Edmund of Lancaster, better known as Edmund Crouchback, due to his crossed back, a reference to the crusader outfit that he wore in the Ninth Crusade. According to Gaunt, though, Crouchback was the oldest son and heir of King Henry III, but due to his physical disabilities, his crouched back, he had been set aside and unlawfully replaced by his brother, Edward I. Conveniently, Gaunt's son, Henry Bolingbroke, was the direct successor of Crouchback by his mother's side. In fact, in a parliament session in 1394, in the presence of the king and Roger, um, in the presence of king and Roger, Gaunt brought forth, brought, brought forth his crouchback fable, suggesting that Bolingbroke should be acknowledged the heir of the throne. Evidently, Roger did not particularly enjoy Gaunt's intervention and vehemently denied it, declaring that Edmund was not the firstborn. And in fact, that Edmund, sorry, uh, the Crouchback was not the firstborn. In fact, he was a most handsome man and noble knight, quote, just as can be clearly seen in the Chronicles, end quote, he emphasized. But what Chronicles was Roger talking about? According to John Harding, the chronicler, Gaunt was himself uh, Gaunt had himself commissioned 
a fake chronicle, now lost, that narrated the Crouchback story. And significantly, Gaunt had planted copies of this fake chronicle in a number of abbeys and monasteries. On the other hand, another chronicle, another chronicler, the Welsh Adam of Usk, in his own chronicle, demonstrated that this Crouchback fable was false by providing a sizable sample of quotations from even other chronicles. And among the many chronicles cited by Adam were the chronicles of the Wigmore Abbey, that abbey sponsored by the Mortimers. Among, which, among them were, was the Historia that he quoted abundantly. We see that, looking at all of this, we see that at the backstage of the Lancaster Mortimer contention, the dissemination of chronicles through monastic houses was considered an effective propaganda strategy to address the hot topics of the 1390s, the succession and Ireland. Over the second half of the 14th century, Ireland had gone through a progressive period of Gaelicization until the point where it was mostly ruled by Irish lords according to Irish law, and most of its population lived according to Irish custom and spoke in Irish language. With the English population in decline and ever decreasing control of the crown, it was beginning to make little sense for Richard II to bear the title of Lord of Ireland, which he did. That's why he departed to Ireland in 1394, and he was the only English king to do that in uh, more than 200 years, deploying an intimidating fleet and astutely also taking with him a number of lords highly invested in Ireland, including Roger, whose claimed estate encompassed about a third of Ireland. This was, this all belonged to Roger on the paper, not in reality, because it was mostly ruled by Irish lords. That is why Yolo Goch, in the end of his poem, um, writes a bloodthirsty instigation. He tells, Yol he tells Roger to destroy Meath, to make an ambush and let 300 be hacked to pieces, to cut, slash, and stab. And he also tells him to arrest Niall O'Neill, was the, the chief um, that ruled Ulster at the time. We move to the genealogical devices. From France to England, passing through Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, the Historia is the culmination of a manuscript about kings. Indeed, before the Chronicle of the Mortimers, we have a pseudo brute chronicle followed by the lists of kings of Scotland, dukes of Cornwall, kings of Wales, Anglo-Saxon kings, English kings. And those lists are followed by a genealogical chronicle of the kings of England. None of this is coincidental. The Mortimers come after so many kings on purpose. They are themselves descendant of kings. And their diagrammatic style resembles this diagrammatic style of the English kings. Large roundels connected by lines with narrative text filling the space left empty by the diagrams. But while the Historia Stemma was clearly designed to be displayed on the codex, the, the royal genealogy, this one, attempts to adapt a model that was conceived for the role as it tries to fit in the compact pages of the codex, these long charts that stretch over meters in royal genealogical roles. This one is from the British Library. And it does that by trimming and tangling in lines, the lines in unwieldy ways for space convenience. We see this one, the child above the parent. And in this one, the lines even cross 
The convolution of lines and lack of heraldry in the royal genealogy contrasts with the colorfulness and order enacted by the Mortimer genealogy. The Historia narrative spans across 300 years. But in this genealogical chronicle, the time measurement unit is not the ear. It is the Mortimer generation, of which there are 11, between Ranulf de Mortimer from the 12th century and Roger, the fourth Earl of March. The open codex ought to be seen as a picture. Each two pages, a depiction of a generation. On their left, left hand side, the Dexter, the father. On the right hand side, the sinister, the mother. And below, we have the progeny. As one turns the pages of the Historia, one goes forth a generation at a time, visualizing time and space through the perceptual grid of the Mortimers and the Wigmore Augustinians. As one turns the pages, one gets a strong sense of stability with few yet significant breaks. The monotonous replication of the Mortimer coat of arms, every folio, every generation, plus the repetitive iteration of the names, Roger, Edmund, Roger, Edmund, gives the feeling that instead of many, there is only one immutable and immortal, Mortimer. This monotony is interrupted by the introduction of a pedigree of Welsh princess Guladus Du, the mother of the first Baron Mortimer, where in big and ornamented letters, the diagrammatic flow is broken by the announcement, here is the genealogy of Lady Guladus, daughter and heir of Llewellyn, once the Prince of Wales, wife of the nobleman, Lord Ruff the Mortimer, Lord of Wigmore. And after that title, follows an exhaustive enumeration of all the ancestry of Prince Guladus, encompassing legendary figures like the King Arthur, characters from Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman and British mythologies, including Seth and Noah, Aeneas, Jupiter, Brutus of Troy, and the last king of Britain, Cadwallader, and going all the way back to Adam, the first creature, Primo Prothoplausti. One should not be surprised by the spotlight given to this remote Welsh noblewoman. Much like the crouch back for the Lancasters, she was a key character for the Mortimer political project. Even if she had been dug up as a reaction to the, Martin, uh, to the Crouchback legend, she, she was a far more useful ancestor than her Lancastrian counterpart. She was more ancient and better connected. She was the daughter of Joan of Plantagenet, who was the oldest child of King John. She was possibly the oldest daughter of Llewellyn the Great, ruler of Wales, whose male line had already ended. And by Llewellyn's side, she was believed to descend from a legendary line of kings and heroes, as I said before. Gularus was the bridge between Welsh royalty and the Mortimers. Yolugoch, like the Historia, also emphasizes Roger's Welsh ancestry, even though he does not mention Princess Gularus at all. He characterizes Roger as a descendant of the pure-fruited Lord of Aberfrau, in reference to Llewellyn the Great. But the Mortimer kinship sp spreads way beyond Wales and Yolo makes sure to note it. Roger is a descendant of the King of England and Scots by Sir Lionel and ultimately his kindred to the entire British Isles and France. His kindred to the, to the Welsh, to the French, to the English and to the Irish. Like the manuscript, the poem also contains traces of spatial genealogy, the mention of a tall genealogy and the illusion of the line of the lion. Here, lion is linked to England by heraldry 
and to Lionel by a pun. However, Yolo's genealogical language is not diagrammatic for the most part, which does not mean it is not visual. In fact, it is very much visual as he uses striking imagery to embody each genealogical claim. When placing Roger in Sir, in Sir Raph's lineage, he calls him a warlike serpent. And when he names him descendant of uh, Sir Llewellyn, he calls him a dragon of the islands of the ocean. We move to heraldry. More than other heraldic emblems, the Mortimer coat of arms can only be altogether apprehended when it is seen. The blazon of a coat of arms, a blazon is a formal description according to the armorial conventions. It is supposed to render an accurate and succinct report or recipe of the heraldic emblem. For instance, the de Burg arms are very straightforwardly described, gold and on top of the gold, a red cross. The Mortimer arms are not so easy to describe and they have proved to be an, an unusually tough challenge for heraldry, for heraldists having received dozens of different blazoning attempts over the centuries. This is just one of them. Indeed, it is a comment on their essentially visual nature that it is ex exceedingly difficult to blazon them adequately. Now, generation after generation, the Lords of Wigmore bear the same coat of arms. As one turns the pages of manuscript 224, the heraldized roundel on the left page, as we saw, of the Historia is always the same until we arrive at Roger, the fourth Earl of March, where the Mortimer armorial monotony suddenly breaks with a new coat of arms that in addition to the usual gold, blue and silver emblem of the Mortimers contains a red cross over gold. That is because Roger combined the Mortimer and the de Burgh emblems into one. Roger's arms are an early example of simple quartered arms, consisting of a single emblem divided into four equal parts, combining two coats of arms. Within the top left and bottom right parts, one finds the most important arms, in this case, the Mortimer. And within the top right and bottom left, one finds the lesser arms, in this case, the de Burgh. In an age when coats of arms were increasingly hereditary, centralized and coded, it often happened that one heraldic emblem performed several overlapping roles. One coat of arms would denote an individual, but it would also denote a family, an office, and a territory. Effectively, in the 14th century, which were uh, the individual Mortimer arms, were the individual, excuse me, uh, effect, effectively in the 14th century, the individual Mortimer arms were also the arms of the Mortimer family, which were the arms of the Earldom of March, which were the arms of the Earl of March. And likewise, the Burke arms had become associated with the Earl of uh, Ulster and the Earldom of Ulster. Now that Roger was able to bear both, them, both of them because his mother was the Countess of Ulster and also the granddaughter of King Edward III, Roger's new March Ulster quartered arms, in which Ireland and Wales intermingled, announced Roger's ambitious international political program and stressed his royal descent at the same time. In fact, Roger was far from controlling his own claim lands in Ireland. His quartered coat of arms echoed those of King Edward III. In January 1340, Edward III formally took the title of King of France. And even though he did not actually control France, he courted the French lilies with the English lions, armorially anticipating his victories overseas. The French did not like that. Analogously, 
Roger was wishfully quartering the Irish and the Welsh arms. His emblem represents the future more than the present. Also anticipating Roger's Irish victories, Yolo spends the second half of his poem commenting on his coat of arms. Halfway through the poem, Yolo assumes the role of a herald, calls for silence, and unravels a symbolic interpretation of Roger's coat of arms that, that will take the entire rest of the poem. He comments on blue, gold, red, and silver. Here introduces this, in, this the symbolic interpretation. Yolo at attributes each color in Roger's arms to a different nation. Gold is France, England is silver, red, Wales, and blue is Ireland. Throughout this section, Yolo proves to be truly deserving of his herald epithet as he employs a number of technical blazing words for the first time in Welsh literature. Moreover, he shows himself to be in tune with the typical theoretical heraldry concerns of his time expressed in the coeval, coeval uh, heraldic treatises of Bado Aurio and John Trevor. Like these treatises, he dedicates more space to creatively deciphering the symbology concealed by colors than to any kind of historical or philosophical exposition. Puns, virtually reduced to their humorous effect, rhetorical paranomasiae puns, have gone through something of a crisis of purpose in recent decades. But in pre-modern times, their role vastly surpassed the merely jocular. Visual puns are everywhere in medieval art. An interesting example of medieval word image play is this image of Adam holding his chest, pectus, peccatoris, pectoris. Now I, I reveal the punchline. Because he is a sinner, peccator, peccatoris. So there is a pun between pectoris and peccatoris. They are famously omnipresent in manuscript marginalia, of course, where one finds the snail, limax, which is a creature of the mud, limus, that is assigned to the limits, limes, of, or, or the thresholds, limen, of the page. And one of the most fecund springs of medieval visual puns is heraldry, of course and its canting arms. The arms of the kingdom of Castile contain a castle and the arms of the berry have bars. This is just to give two of truly a myriad examples. And even the silver escutcheon in the Mortimer arms has been suggested to purposefully evoke the Dead Sea, Mortuum Mare, referring to the visit that an early Mortimer paid to the Palestine during the First Crusade. The first and most obvious visual pun in the Historia is exactly of this kind, canting arms. The arms attributed to William Longespe. Longespe means long sword. And his coat of arms is charged with a long sword, so long that it even sticks out of the roundel. The obvious paronomasia in the arms of Longespe, the longsword, is far from attempting a humorous effect. It's not a joke. Instead, it serves a pedagogical and mnemonical end, working as a kind of visual etymology. Isidore of Seville defined etymology as the origin of words when the force or energy or vigor of a verb or noun is gathered through interpretation providing examples of what he meant, such as the etymology of human. The word human, homo, comes from the word earth, humus. The pun fails at providing a scientifically accurate etymology to modern standards, but on the other hand, by establishing that earth is the vis of the human, it invites reflection on the existential contingency of the human being. 
Analogously to the Isidorian verbal etymology, the goal of the arms of the longest fair are not to find the true nature of an object, but to unlock and gather up the energy of the word. It imprints the V's of the Mortimers right at the foot of their diagram. Royalty by the royal arms and chivalry by the sword. And it's worth saying that this is not actually longest best coat of arms. So like the fake etymologies of Isidore, uh, this is fake you know, in, uh, to the modern standards, of course. Uh, the historian's goal is not to, to provide us a, an accurate description. Apart from the rondels and lines, the historian is scarcely illuminated. Several initials are ornamentated with vegetal and rhythmic patterns, but only two of them display figurative motives. The first such initial displays a lush vine sprouting from the beginning of Gulado's genealogy. Its foliage extends upward in triangular shape with intertwined branches supported by a trellis, forming a leafy treetop. Tree and from the bottom of the initial, a long stem punctuated with leaves and numerous tendrils descends along Gulado's pedigree down to the very bottom of the page. The second initial, hanging from the beginning of a description of the first Earl of Marsh, represents a dragon spitting fire. In fact, the dragon does not spit fire, but foliage, curvy vine stems leap out of the dragon's mouth and tail. But why vine stems and why a dragon? These images are not merely embellishing text. Their conception required a great deal of skill and resources. There is purpose behind them. In the Latin literate and very visual Latin uh, late medieval monastic framework, a vine plant in a genealogical context would be readily understandable on various intertwining interpretation layers. At the basis of this image is once more a pun. Vine in Latin is vitis. But vitis is also the dative and ablative plural of vita, Latin for life. Thence, the vine representations encompass multiple yet interrelated meanings. Two lives, four lives, from lives, with lives, etc. Could there be a better and more succinct way to describe the hybrid of individuality, kinship, motion, stability that a genealogy conveys? The vine plant is the perfect visual etymology because it exhibits the vis of the genealogy the genealogy of Roger, the fourth Earl of March, to be sure, because both images are painted with the four colors of his arms, as if visually incorporating into his identity, the full heritage of the princess and the first Earl. The first image exhibits furthermore, the ancient and powerful arboreal metaphor. It is a family tree. For starters, it forces one to twist reading directions. The entire, Historia diagram and texts are read from top to bottom. And here, one has to read the tree from bottom up. Starting with Arthur and Cadwallader, teleologically up to Mortimer. It is, it is a compelling metaphor unfolding from the Welsh English princess the roots descend and envelop her mythical British royal ancestry, the very foundation of the Mortimer identity. Fertile and prolific, the family tree copiously expands. And finally, at the highest point, the treetop touches the Mortimer coat of arms. The same blood or sap flows in the face of the British kings of old and the lords of Wigmore. As for Yolo Goch, he also uses tree metaphors. He calls Roger a sweet tree 
of talent and a bud of Usk, alluding to the fact that Roger was born in Usk, but he certainly has a special affinity with the dragon. In line with Welsh poetic tradition, uh, we have nowadays Wales, uh, the, the flag of Wales is the dragon. Yolo associates the red dragon, Idraig Goch, with the Welsh British or the British, and the white dragon, Idraig Wen, or yeah, with the English Saxons, the English or the Saxons. Welsh poets would usually depict the white dragon oppressing the red, prophesizing though that the eventual, that eventually the red dragon would triumph over the white. And for Yolo, this foretold victory is a foot. It is prophesized that it's our dragon, which will perform the feats this year from the head of the lion with mighty sword will be crowned one of the family of Gwynedd. And in lines 15 to 17, Yolo generates one of the most important alliterations of the poem. Dragon of the islands of the ocean, dragon of four, I am prophesizing truly, it is time for you to come to Wales where you deserve praise. Drag, dragun, dragon. Here, the alliteration between Dragun and Darogan is not only harmonious, but purposeful. Darogan means a prophecy or a vaticinatory song, and Dragun can either mean dragon or warrior or war leader. Hence, a chain of puns links the forms and the contents of the words. Drag, Darogan, Dragun, dragon, leader, prophecy. The Mortimer dynasty came to an end in 1425, when Roger's son Edmund, the fifth Earl of March, died in Ireland. Like his father, and even his grandfather. Yet he cannot be, it cannot be said that the Mortimer plan fails entirely. Indeed, Roger managed to sit two great grandsons on the throne, Edward IV and Richard III. And eventually, he became a common ancestor to all the kings of England from Henry VIII to Elizabeth II. After Roger's death and Richard's deposition followed a time more precarious still for political legitimacy. In the 15th century, there were episodes that challenged royal authority like never before. These included the rising of Glandur and the conflicts of the Wars of the Roses. Yet again, the Mortimer visual legacy played a role. Prophetic poetry was rebrandished, long pedigrees were crafted anew, and red dragons were summoned once more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. It was a very nice and interesting uh, presentation. And uh, so I, I hope we'll have uh, um, a really uh, uh, nice uh, discussion after your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I ask if um, anybody wants to to be the first to to put any question to, to Miguel or, or to 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 make a comment. No. But perhaps I I I I, I could begin. So um, of course I I I I I, I like very much uh, the the um, your heraldic analysis and uh, it, it is uh, you, I, I think you 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 focused on a, um, a very important matter, um, the relation between visual culture and, uh, well, audio culture. Um, the, the, and, and it is really something that um, both historians and heraldists miss 
uh, um, many times because we are so used to um, to to, uh, to 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 using the the the, the documents that we uh, uh, tend to to forget that um, principally in in the Middle Ages. Uh, the, the 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 audio culture uh, I mean the, the sound culture was really so important not not only um the, the speaking but also well the the, the noises and, yeah. and the music of course and the the um, the and also the the, the screaming in, in heraldry for instance yeah. of course you you you, you have a, a heraldic Screams. I don't know if you say that in, in English. Gritos in Arabic. screams, screaming. Um, and so it, it was very, very interesting to 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 see your analysis of this interconnection of visual elements and uh, uh, um, audio elements in these manuscripts. Um, and. Um, I think you you manage very well to 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 show us how uh, it is important to study the 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 images in in medieval medieval manuscripts um not only by themselves as well many historians of art uh, keep on doing um but in their relation with the, the the very the very um, uh, um, meaning of the the, the the text that they uh, illustrate and their relation with the, the 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 culture in general that in 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 where in wherever they were generated and they uh, uh, circulated. So um, I think your your um, presentation was really very very nice uh, uh, in 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 that kind of opening uh, um, the perspectives of, of of this kind of of, of study. Um, I, I would like to point to you some um, details in the images that you you you've shown to us. Um, it is interesting to to see that the lines that form the the circles are drawn in in two colors in in red and in blue so um do you think the choice of these two colors is also meaningful um because it it seems to me that it could be another way of uh, uh, reinforcing the the idea of of the um, uh, the, the the right of the Mortimers to the throne of of England, because of course uh, these are the the heraldic colors of mm -hmm. of of England at the time. Of course, the the French blue and the the red um, English. Mm -hmm. So that's my 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 first uh, question. Um, I would also ask you um, something else. In that double um, double recuperation of uh, um, the genealogy of the Mortimers, on the one hand, the the, <clears throat> the uh, Lancaster origin, and on the other the other end. The the Goladus and and the, and the um, uh, Welsh origin. Um, this double recuperation uh, was it accompanied by the recuperation of some kind of um, emblematics emblems of these two uh, families. Um, sure. So uh, about your first comments, I, um, I, I, I had to cut for, for reasons of time, a very interesting uh, detail on, on these two sources. One is that 
uh, which is that uh, uh, Yolo presents himself as a herald, and uh, uh, which is interesting on itself and deserves a lot of comment. But uh, while I was transcribing the, the chronicle and, and looking at the texts, uh, there is a moment when one of the scribes, because there is more than one scribe, but the main scribe and the scribe that was writing on, on this time period, the 1390s, he describes himself as the orator. So uh, uh, there is a, an intermixing of sound and sight uh, on, on the chronicles written, oh, on the, the sources uh, there. And then the, he, he laments the death of uh, Edmund III Earl and, call, call, and says, and I, the orator, I uh, cry your death and, says, and talks in this personal tone. And um, which again, uh, uh, makes us think a lot about how these uh, sources were, were experienced. Uh, were they read aloud? Were they um, performed in some way? So these are all interesting questions. Um, about the two colors in the diagram, the red and the blue, I, I actually um, asked for advice to a number of people because I, my first impression was uh, that th uh, these, these uh, edges, the edges connecting the the roundels, they um, evoked uh, blood and veins and arteries. That was my first impression. And that, so I talked to some specialists in medieval medicine to, to see if there is any representation of the circulatory system. Of course, uh, there, there isn't uh, with bl uh, blue and red. Uh, they said what, 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 seems, what, what seems to be the case is that red and blue are two, two very common inks in this period, in this uh, place. Now, uh, what is very uncommon about these, these diagrams and, this, um, and these edges is their shape. They have these weird jagged lines. Uh, and I haven't seen them like this, like uh, these angular um, shapes before. I have seen many diagrams with red and blue. Um, of course, it doesn't mean it's a, it doesn't mean it's a coincidence. Uh, maybe it, it was it was still done on purpose, and maybe it has something to do with blood and and with with uh, Mortimer's. It's it's not probable that it has something to do with arteries and veins, and I I think it's not probable it has something to do with heraldry. I don't think so. Um, so. I, yeah, <laughs> about the, the emblems um, of uh, Princess Gladys and, uh, and um, Crouchbeck. I'm not sure about Crouchbeck, but Princess Gladys, they, they went back. So there are many, in, in this chronicle, you have, uh, you have heraldic emblems that go way back to pre-heraldic pre times. Uh, some of them came by tradition and some of them were invented. Uh, well, so as, as far as we know, uh, of course. Um, one of the ones that I only know in, uh, the, the one that, that I showed of uh, Longest Pay, I only know from this manuscript and a much uh, later manuscript from the 16th century. So that's one of the cases that of a prehistoric, of, of a pre heraldic uh, emblem. And um, Princess Gladys has also a, an emblem on her page that is not, that is not uh, accurate. So the traditional Aberfrau emblem. Thank you very much. Just to, 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 to complement what you just told us, um, it's very interesting uh, that the, the, the chronicle um, presents himself as orator and, and herald, because in fact, um, in many times, uh, heralds do present themselves as uh, as 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 um, as uh, um, those who express by sound the the truth. 
And mm. uh, in French, there's a, a, a very interesting uh, medieval um, way of saying it, it. It's voir disant, voir disant. So to, 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 to see and tell or, or, or see telling. Um, and, and that's really the, 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 the same concept that, that is behind uh, uh, the two, the two um, officers, the, 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 the Chronicle and the Herald. So um, yes. when he's telling us, telling us, us that he's a Chronicle or a Herald, he, he's saying, in fact, well, nearly the same thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Maria João? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Miguel. This was very good as uh, one would expect it to be um, and very interesting. I was very interested by two things. This um, positive reading of the dragon, um, uh, which is also a very ambivalent uh, uh, well, animal <laughs> ancestor. Um, and also, I wanted to know, did I perhaps did not understand, but there seems to be a history told about the, the female lineage of, uh, uh, but not the male one. I mean, the Crouchback, is there, sto are there stories told? Are they made up like, is there anything that might connect them as mythical ancestors? Is there a, a a composition or not because probably not i understood from what you said that there wasn't it there was just this this uh, decoration of them so to speak as uh, really important ancestors but are there any stories told about them that sort of bring up their um, mythical ancestry to the lineage more clear i thought with the uh, what was it, Loden? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. There was more than with the Crouchback. Uh, if there is a, an explicit uh, source talking about the Crouchback fable? Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you for, for both questions. Uh, so so about, about the dragon, I have, I have more thoughts on the vine than the dragon, because the vine is, especially in the monastic context, um, a clear allegory of Christ. Uh, and you see, there's a lot of medieval iconography of the vine, and because uh, Christ in, in, in the scripture say some, uh, might say something like, I am the vine, I think. Mm -hmm. And there are many crucifixes with the vine, and, and many, there's a lot of iconography. And, uh, and so there could be a, 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 a Christian. I, um, interpretation for these two images, one of Christ and the other of the devil. And so this was my one possible thought. What, what makes me and tr not trust, um, what makes me mistrust this interpretation is that the dragon is on, uh, on the description of the first Earl of March. And the first Earl of March is a, a, a character of, the, of English history that is hated by everyone. Uh, because he, he betrayed the king, he, he took his wife, he invaded, he, he was condemned to death, he's lost all his titles. But on the chronicle, and again, I cut this from the presentation, <laughs> on, the chron on this chronicle, the Historia, uh, he is praised like he was the best person in the world. He, he's praised uh, as he was a very generous man, uh, he was handsome, uh, he was... A, a, all, all of these things, none of none of the bad things is mentioned are mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not and and then about his successors, it is denied that they lost the, the titles. Uh, there is a moment when in the chronicle says that uh, there are some people that say that uh, Edmund lost his titles. It's not true as there is a there is a letter of the king testifying that and then he, he transcribes the letter of the king. Uh, and then well, they, they go to a great extent to show that um, Roger, the first Earl of March, was actually a good guy. And, uh, and that's why I think 
that um, that's why I think that the dragon is there on purpose to show that to 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 confirm the prophecy that the dragon was killed. The red dragon was killed by the white dragon. The, the red dragon, the Welsh red dragon, was killed by the white red uh, white dragon uh, of the English, only to come back later. It was one Roger Mortimer that was killed, and now it's another Roger Mortimer that is to come back. Of course, this last segment that I just said is a bit uh, uh, needs needs some further um, exploration, of course. But uh, I think it would be really uh, a bad move on the Mortimer part to to put a devilish dragon on on the guy they they are trying to promote. <laughs> so that's my argument. Uh, on the on the um, on the crouchbacks, yes, uh, there is some confirmation that well, they used crouchback for sure. Bolingbroke, mm -hmm. when when Bolingbroke ascended to the throne, um, he they what is written on the the documents is that he ascended because he descended by on the right line of. Um, Henry the Third, I think, yeah. And if he descended of Henry the Third and not on Edward the Third, that means that the only reason for this is they are using Crouchback. Uh, so this, uh, and, and then and there, there is more. There's more. So uh, we have um, uh, Adam of Ask was summoned by uh, the chronicler. Adam of Ask was summoned by by Edward the Fourth to search for possible ex for a justification of the Crouchback legends and Adam of Usk search for them and didn't find them uh, because the Lancasters really wanted to, to prove that it was true. Uh, they, did, they, they couldn't. So I don't know if this answers your question. Um. Thank you very much. And, and may I say something about the, the, the devilish dragon? <laughs> um, it's of course, as Maria Jean just t t told us, it's it's a, 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 an ambivalent uh, creature. But I I, I I have to remember you that um, the dragon in in this time this time uh, um, is is much connected also to Arthur. It, it's of course. Uh, 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 in in the Im imaginary arms attributed to to King Arthur, it, it, it is his crest. So, and and I'm I, I'm quite sure that uh, when the King John the First of Portugal um, adopted the the dragon as his crest, uh, and then of course his successors went on using it. Uh, I, I think it's an Arthurian. Arthurian uh, um, uh, image uh, so of course it's really ambivalent but it could also um, establish another link to the royal um, uh, heraldry in in this arthurian uh, sense uh, arthur mm -hmm. son of uh, uther pendragon yes. of course mm -hmm. um is there any other question or, or comment to, to Miguel. Um, João Portugal, uh, uh, I think he cannot uh, participate uh, uh, directly, but he 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 wanted to to um, felicitar, to congratulate, uh, congratulate you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, he liked very much your presentation, and uh, he he also wants to. To challenge you in in this way, I'm reading his message. Um, it's it's very interesting your um, uh, your analysis of uh, the these uh, crypto dynastic um, strategies, and uh, it would be very interesting to um, to be able to uh, do the same thing that you 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 just did to the Mortimer. Um, uh, to to the, the the over to the other houses um, that claimed the English throne in the 15th century, uh, not only 
the House of York, of course, as her heir to the House of March, but also to the house, houses of Lancaster, Beaufort, and Tudor, because they all have uh, this kind of uh, really um, complex, really, uh, uh, um, how to say it? Um, sophisticated. Sophisticated, thank you. Uh, um, visual strat strategies of claiming the English throne. So that's uh, uh, Jean Portugal's suggestion. You, you yes. meet him tomorrow at, at yes, Carmel. Yes, that is true. Uh, yes, uh, and, and other people have been saying the same. And, and uh, the, this, uh, this chronicle would be, if I wanted to go further in time to the Wars of the Roses, this chronicle would have to be part of that analysis because this chronicle, I, I'm focused on the 1390s, but it, it started being written before and it kept being written after. And it was, um, of, although when the, when the, what is written after is, is in, very incomplete and, and hard to understand, but there are many erasures, things that are erased and, and corrected and uh, later editions that were done on the, on the time of the Yorks. And, and emblems that were that somebody started drawing but didn't finish, and that is a very interesting piece of the of the enormous gigantic puzzle of the Wars of the Roses. Um, so yeah, so I could I could even start here if I wanted to go for for. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, does anyone else want to? to make a, a question or a comment. I would like Sandra. to to congratulate with uh, Miguel for this very interesting uh, uh, conference and uh, to see that it's it's very important to study this um, genealogical tree uh, because is is a is a is a, is a sort of a, Mm, uh, representation of the family, but it's something that uh, that is not only for uh, um, uh, uh, aristocratical use, but mm. that came from uh, um, uh, sacred use. Uh, we we think about uh, the tree of Jesse, for example, and uh, there is a, a lot of uh, um, uh, literature and intellectual product that came from this, um, this um, ideal of, uh, of genealogical um, uh, representation. And it's very interesting because uh, these diagrams um, seems to me very similar about the Genealogia Regum Francorum of uh, Bernard Guy that I've studied and um, that, uh, that is a, a work, a very interesting work with um, the, the tree uh, picked and, uh, and um, uh, picked and uh, um, really uh, realized about the author of, the, of, the, of this work, uh, Bernard Guy. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, these images came uh, with the text. So the image help the text and are uh, to think that are um, uh, that, that uh, we can we can use and work one without the other. So uh, the text and the images are linked. Uh, and it's it's very interesting and it's very important. And also I think it's important to interpret the images in this sense, um, in, a, in a historical uh, context. This is uh, also a, a very important uh, operation that uh, everyone of, uh, of researcher have to do. Uh, 
So because um, uh, because uh, without this uh, link, without this, uh, it's not easy to to understand the the true um, meaning of of these images. So it was it was very it was very interesting to to hear you. And uh, and also this um, uh, all your citation about uh, about drolleries uh, or images of uh, animals it's uh, it's very important because uh, these animals are not decoration uh, are not an ornament but um, in the in the lot of cases are uh, something that mean uh, something. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important to understand this meaning and to understand that they are not only something beautiful or pretty or, but are something that want to uh, speak about a concept to the observator, to the lector. So this is very, this is very interesting. Yes, um, I think that what I what I experienced while while investigating these sources is that uh, if you if you are looking at images you cannot lose track of the text and if you are looking at text you cannot lose track of the images because they really have to they really are connected always uh, uh, we saw that r right now with the, the dragon we, you have to look at the dragon while looking at the text about the first Earl of March and um, it also happens in other instances. Um, there are several moments in the text where, where heraldic matters are talked about without uh, image accompanying them. So there is image written. There is written image. Uh, there are interestingly there are two moments where, with uh, libraries. I think that's how you put it, libraries. So heraldic clothing, um, and these two moments represent moments when. Uh, the Earls of March are revolting against the king, interestingly. It's, a, it's a, a, an interesting thing. So the first uh, one of them is the first Earl of March and his friends are marching to London. His friends, his companions are marching to London. They are all dressed in a tunic, a green tunic with a, a yellow hand. And this is described in the, in the text. And, and then they, they move forward. So it's, it's the rebellion against the king, and they are all dressed in this way. And another one is when Richard II calls the uh, a parliament and calls uh, uh, Roger the Fourth Earl, and Roger shows up, and then he, he faces a, a, a an enormous crowd, all dressed in his livery, uh, in red and and white, uh, because they wanted to, him to be king, and and. And Richard was not happy about that, and, he, uh, and so we see these two moments where the king clashes with, uh, against the against the, the earl, and there is color, and you have to be you, and there is heraldry, and you have to uh, to pay attention to, to the, the visual cues in the text. Um, and also, I also agree with you what, what you said about the, the, the historical context in the images. You cannot you have to. But I mean, in the case of the 14th century, that's really easy, the, the end of the 14th century, because we, we basically live in the 14th century. <laughs> so uh, it's just, we don't have to, to think too much about it. Uh, the invasion of Ireland, uh, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's easy to think about it in terms of the invasion of Ukraine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, but there are many parallels, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. And and you you also raised a very interesting subject about the um, uh, heraldic legends that really are a, a common uh, phenomenon uh, uh, of these times. And and it's very interesting to see how uh, this kind of legends um, are all in in all Western uh, Europe. You you have them uh, at these times, and 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 we've uh, uh, mostly the, the 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 same kind of uh, structure. It would be very very interesting to to to, to study uh, the 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 in, in, study these heraldic legends 
in a comparative way between, uh, well, let's say England and, and France and Spain, uh, Castile, uh, Aragon and Portugal and Italy, because I, I think it's, it's a very, very interesting topic. Marie João? Não se ouve. Just a simple, very simple note. I was remembering there is a chronicle of an Arab chronicle of the 12th century when after the caliph was hurt and he was very badly hurt in 1184, they go back to Seville and uh, the description tells us that he, they should have gone back with, I'm, I'm now a bit confused and you will forgive me, it's age uh, doesn't forgive us, it's not forgiving. I'm not sure whether they entered with the red or the white uh, pendants, but the caliph told them to put up the victory pendants so that everybody understood they had won the battle, which they hadn't, and he was ill and was going to die within a matter of days. But they couldn't afford to go into Seville with the pendants of the defeat, which I'm not sure which color it is. It's, um, uh, I think they came in with red when they should have come in with black. I'm not too sure. I'm hesitating between black and white. But uh, anyway, this color code for uh, allegiance and for uh, fidelity and for uh, loyalty is uh, transcultural, I think. Yes. And the color coding of, uh, um, uh, I was going to say emotions, it's more than emotions, it's uh, of communication. It's quite important, quite important. Political communication and all sorts of communications are based on color codes and uh, the way they're perceived by others. So it's not just, Christian realities, I think, beyond that, we can find similar examples, and that was it. Yes, and, and even in the poem, we see, we see this, this at play, not just with the, the comment on, the, on, the, on Roger's emblem, there are other moments with, with a lot of color, uh, and there's, there's a moment when, when Yologor talks about the cross of Arthur, and which is a bit mysterious, and uh, and, I've, and there's there there's a big list of the imaginary um, uh, arms of Arthur. It's, it's not just one, but one of them, or more than one of them, has a cross, and mm -hmm. one of uh, one of them has a has a, 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 a silver cross over green. I'm not saying the, ter the correct terminology on purpose, <laughs> and the, uh, an image of the Virgin Mary on. On one corner, um, and I, I believe that, it, that the effect, that the planned effect, is exactly a, you are hearing the either uh, <laughs> either the the em, either the emblem was on display while the the poet was performing the the the, the, the poem, or uh, the idea is that it flashes on your head when you hear. The cross of Arthur, you you see the 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 white cross over green, yes. and um, and you and you immediately associate. Okay, this Roger is Arthur. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you're learned enough, you have the code to decodify it. That's quite yes. important, I think. And of course, in the 12th century, all those symbols were Christianized, and so you could use them without it mm -hmm. being a heretical thing to do. And that's also mm -hmm. quite interesting, but I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you, Maria Joao. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The dragon is, uh, I think the dragon is one of the most interesting, most important examples of that. And especially in, in Wales, the dragon, I don't think the dragon would ever be seen as a bad, uh, as a as a bad thing, if you talk about dragons, you're talking about good things. <laughs> yes, and 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 sometimes you have like uh, um, cryptic figures. You 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 are telling us about the um, the quartered arms of mm -hmm. the of uh, Roger Mortimer, and and of course there are reasons for quartering the, the arms, but there are, there is also um, a, a, a symbolic 
uh, reason uh, for quartering the arms. Because of course, when you divide the, 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 uh, a shield by quartering, you, you are making a cross. And, oh, yeah. and, 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 and that was really uh, uh, explicitly uh, present in the Castilian Leonese arms, uh, that the first quartering, uh, quartered arms known. Um, and besides um, aesthetic questions and 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 uh, and the hierarchical questions, the symbolic uh, uh, value of the, the the quartered shields is very important, mm -hmm. of course. Yes, and you you uh, you may not notice uh, uh, it when you you just see a, a heraldic. Um, normality in quartering arms, of course. So, um, Miguel, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. I, I, will, I would last, I, I would ask uh, Maria Alessandra to, to, to close the session. Uh, yes, Th thank you, Miguel. Uh, thank you uh, again uh, for your inter very interesting uh, uh, conference. And um, today we we close uh, not only this uh, third cycle uh, of uh, international webinar, but we close uh, for the moment the uh, this uh, um, this activity, this cycle of uh, of webinar. So uh, today. Uh, I have to say that uh, this, um, uh, this even this um, uh, this cycle of conference that uh, uh, have um, have invented during the pandemic year uh, for supply uh, of our uh, presential event uh, became um, uh, an, a, a very a very success successfully even with uh, uh, a lot of public uh, for three years. And uh, every year, so we have uh, a lot of student, professor, colleagues, friend that uh, came here in this uh, uh, virtual classroom to discuss with us about uh, manuscripts, about uh, heraldry, about, um, about art, about history. And um, we are very, very happy about, uh, uh, about this because I think that uh, this platform has been a, a successful platform and uh, um, a, a useful, uh, a useful um, way to, to discuss all together uh, from different country about our, uh, our studies, our research. And um, the good news is that uh, um, we, we leave uh, the international cycle of the webinar, but uh, next year, uh, Miguel uh, Sestes and I uh, will organize a workshop uh, on this uh, subject, on this topic, uh, a one day workshop. Uh, we wish that uh, it will be in, uh, in person and uh, perhaps it will be with a mixed uh, modality to permit uh, uh, our colleagues and friends from other country to join us in this day but it will be in person in Lisbon and uh, we we'll continue to discuss about uh, all these uh, topic that are that we love uh, very much uh, so um, I, I thank you I, I thank thank you very much to everyone uh, to all the present, the participant, and perhaps I leave uh, the speech to Miguel to say just uh, uh, a last um, word of um, of farewell. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Miguel, for presenting us uh, such a, 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 an exciting uh, um, presentation, and and thank you all uh, that accompanied us today and and on the other days of our uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Até amanhã, Miguel. Até amanhã. Olha, foi muito, muito interessante. Gostei imenso da sua apresentação.